for those who don't know, my name is Simeon. I'm on staff here, um, and I'm also going to be starting my master's on uh, the history of St. Paul's, the first 100 years of St. Paul's history, uh, and how that is then reflected in our architecture, including our windows, furnishings, stonework, and all these other things. And so that's really where a lot of this information has come from this evening. Um, again, one of the disadvantages of speaking in the evening is that we lose... Uh, the very windows that we're talking about, they become these, you know, these dark masses. But um, I go quite heavy on the slides, so if you keep your eyes on the screens, you should uh, be able to see everything I'm talking about. And um, these are the Western Four, and uh, the, each one is filled with a character that represents a particular um, element of our church heritage. And uh, they follow the scheme of king, bishop, knight, and pioneer. And we looked at that last week. Uh, this evening, we're going to have a look at the rose window, which is illuminated beautifully there by JJ, uh, and also all of the windows of our nave, which are all the windows that Esther just referred to here along the north wall and here along the south wall. And uh, it may seem like not that much to cover in an evening, but you'll be amazed what there is to know about them. Um, now, I mentioned last week, oh, incidentally, this was a slide. I had a couple of issues with the PowerPoint last week. This was a slide I wanted to include but couldn't, um, but it's a, a, a magazine from 1914 from Herbert Brothers advertising their business um, using our four windows as their kind of examples. And I love this little note they include in the advert, which says, awarded at the Auckland Exhibition, first prize, special prize, and the gold medal. So quite... What that was judged on, I have no idea, but these windows won those awards, and, uh, and they were very proud of that fact. So that was a slide that was missing from last week. Also last week, I mentioned a couple of names for areas within a church building, and uh, it seemed to uh, surprise a few people, so I thought it might help to cover a couple of the basics tonight, since uh, one or two of these will be mentioned this evening. And so essentially, um, this is a, a neo-Gothic church, and it's based on a medieval Gothic kind of style. We'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Um, but the idea is that, that the church um, would follow the layout of a cruciform pattern, and it would be facing east. So if you know your scripture, you know Jesus is coming back from the east uh, in, in Revelation, and that's why churches always face east, so you're facing him when he rocks up. Incidentally, that's why people are also buried facing east in uh, Anglican cemeteries. Um, and so you enter through uh, the west wall, you come into the nave, which is this central part, and uh, you have the aisles either side of what's beyond the pillars. And then you have these sections called transepts, normally in a church building, which uh, make the cruciform shape. And then you have the chancel or the sanctuary beyond that with the altar. Now, and there's a lot of different details and, and, and elements that get added to that, but this is essentially your basic design. Um, now, in a moment, these are Skinner's uh, blueprints for this church. And as you can see, it's, um, it's not exactly following that pattern. One thing that we're missing is transepts. Um, and actually, when it was originally built, we also didn't have any chancel. But uh, if we kind of superimpose some lines, we see where these divisions come in. So this main central bulk is essentially the nave. You've got the bell tower there in the corner, which is, uh, was one of the primary entrances originally. Um, and the transepts is sort of mirrored by um, Our Lady Chapel on one side and by the vestry on the other side. So while we don't have transepts, we have chapels that kind of fill that role and kind of just extend out enough to kind of give a sense of, um, of a similar kind of architectural layout here. So there you go. Um, so next week, we're going to be looking at some of the glass in the sanctuary and the glass of the chapels. Um, this is where we start talking about Whitefriars windows, the ones that Esther is particularly keen on. Um, but that's next week. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about, uh, again, the rows and the aisles. Um, and also, just as a little refresher, we had a few um, <coughs> terms that people maybe weren't aware of. So I always thought stained glass referred to any kind of colored glass, but actually that's not true. Uh, stained glass is only the, the bottom on this list. It's glass made up of lots of small panes that are painted and fired uh, and things like that. Whereas cathedral glass is what we have in our rose window, which is panes of one individual color used together to form a pattern. And leaded glass is what we have in our aisle windows, which is essentially um, plain glass, mostly, or very, very pale colored glass with small embellishments and details. And so while tonight it's called stained, none of our windows are actually stained this evening, but still in theme. So um, let's have a look at a little bit of the history of the rose. It is believed that 
Our rose window probably contains the original glass from uh, 1895 when this church was opened. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any hard evidence that that's the case, but it's kind of based on this. This is one of the earliest photographs of this church that I could find. It's from before the 1900s. And, uh, and it shows you the rose window beautifully, but you can't tell whether there's plain glass or colored glass. And this interior shot from the same series also can't show us whether we had plain or colored glass, uh, but you can see the stone tracery there. Uh, and personally, I know it's a slight, a bit, a bit questionable, but there seems to be less of a light hue coming through the rose window than through the plain glass of the other western wall windows, which would suggest to me that there were probably colored glass and therefore less light was getting through. It's a bit of an argument from silence because also we argue, well, there's no uh, record that we know of that talks about the plain glass being replaced with cathedral glass, so then it's probably original. And if it is original, then it's the only colored glass uh, of the church when it opened in 1895. So this is our rose, and it's a beautiful window. Uh, I encourage you to have a good long stare when you come next Sunday and the light's shining through it. It's a beautiful geometric pattern with at least six colors, which is quite unusual for cathedral glass. They normally have three or four. Um, and I thought it would be good to understand a bit of the history of the rose as, as a way of understanding our window and where it comes from. So circular mosaics and geometric patterns have uh, existed from Roman times. We can see uh, and the Greeks. Um, and some of the early uh, Roman buildings, particularly the Dome of the Pantheon, feature circular windows they call oculus. Uh, several churches around Eastern Europe and the late Empire territories uh, also included circular windows with patterns in them from around the, uh, probably around the 8th, 9th century. And it's kind of a part of a Romanesque design. Um, but things really kind of take off from around the 11th and the 12th century, when medieval architecture starts to develop um, this idea of Gothic. This is uh, Saint-Denis. It's considered really the first, um, the first uh, Gothic building, or the first medieval Gothic church building, uh, because it kind of incorporated a lot of new design ideas that were existing, and it combined them all into one building. And it kind of became a bit of a landmark example that this was a new style that was independent of everything else. Uh, and that kind of started with Saint-Denis, and that had a rose window. Unfortunately, the original rose window no longer exists, but that's the one that currently replaces it. Um, yeah, and it dates a little bit later than the original. Um, this architectural style, this new Gothic style, uh, inspired architects throughout Europe, and as technology improved, and more detailed tracery, we, that's the stonework in between, as more detailed tracery developed, uh, the focus started coming away from ornate stone with little glass punctuations towards the focus being on uh, you know, stained glass, images in the glass, where the stone was essentially stripped back to the absolute minimum. And uh, you can see that most prominently here when you compare these two windows, uh, Notre Dame being uh, an example of, perhaps the finest example of the later Gothic style. Um, by 1215, there was another cathedral, uh, Chartres Cathedral. And this is uh, quite significant for us, which we'll talk about a bit later. And in its southern transept, you have this beautiful rose window that we're going to talk about. Um, and Chartres, again, it included a number of architectural features that were quite landmark and represented a new watershed in Gothic design. Um, and it had three huge rose windows as part of it. It wasn't long after, literally probably about 30 or 40 years later, that you then get Notre Dame and Reims. And this is where um, the rose window had grown to its, possible, to its maximum possible size. If we look here, this is the interior of Notre Dame's incredible window, and by now the rose was as wide as the nave itself, uh, and was, you know, surrounded by all kinds of details and embellishments and lancets and everything. It, it couldn't get any bigger or any fancier uh, than it had done at Notre Dame. Yeah, so um, as Gothic architecture improved, without wanting to go too much into Gothic architecture, one of the major ideas was essentially elevating these huge stone buildings as high as you could possibly go. And for their day, they were just, um, just feats of engineering that just blew the mind of everyone that saw them. And it, it raised your eyes heavenward and kind of drew your attention and your focus up. And part of that was also um, was the way the pillars were designed, was to basically be the entire load bearing on the pillars so that you could strip away many of the walls and fill that then with glass, which would fill your halls with light and all the rest of it. And again, it was all part of this, um, 
creating the sense of the divine. We'll talk a bit about how Gothic architecture was all about, was all representative of uh, submersing people into the Christian experience um, when they came into a, a Gothic building. And so, yeah, essentially, as the, the pillars were able to be strengthened to go higher, the arches allowed greater weights to be supported. Um, and so things like this became increasingly po uh, possible. Um, but Gothic architecture, as with all things, uh, had its heyday, and then it was replaced in popularity. Um, as the Renaissance really kicked in, uh, there was a new love for the, the classics, and uh, Greek and Roman styles came to be the most popular. And so here we have a couple of examples, most famously, of course, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, of whom we take our name, uh, was a neoclassical. Essentially, so when you get a re-understanding uh, re or a rediscovery of what already has been, you just slap neo in front of it. So this was neoclassical, and, um, and that was quite popular. Local examples, incidentally, include St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, which is just a little further down Simon Street, built in 1882, or at least the uh, neoclassical bit added on was 1882, uh, and the Baptist Tabernacle on Queen Street. Similar kind of thing. Um, but after the neoclassical, there was a whole movement towards neo-Gothic, uh, let's return back to the medieval Gothic style because that's where true Christian architecture finds its home. And it was spurred by a guy called Pugin and a, a group of others. Um, but the short version is it really captured the public imagination. And that's where you get things like the Houses of Parliament built around 1840 to 1876. Pugin was one of the um, designers involved in that. Um, and there was just a lot of these big uh, government buildings and um, also churches started to follow this kind of reinvented Gothic style. And they fine-tuned exactly what was and what was not Gothic and tried to get rid of some of the unnecessary bits uh, and, and kind of establishing rules and laws of what you should and shouldn't do when creating a neo-Gothic building, um, some of which is followed very well in this building, some of which is completely ignored. Um, but that's for a, a talk of another time. Um, other examples include uh, cathedrals and churches built up and down uh, Britain around this time, uh, including some of these examples. Uh, this one on the right, St. Giles's in Cheadle. This was Pugin's chance to basically create the perfect neo-Gothic church. And he absolutely went to town, and it's, um, it's quite a, a historic landmark mark in England, and um, it's kind of Pugin's fantasy of what all churches should be if he had the budget. Um, and he's gone quite crazy with it. And it is an amazing church from what I've seen. I've not visited it personally, uh, but it's, it's quite famous for that reason. Um, and this was the time that St. Paul's was being built. And um, in the same way that so much was being shipped from the motherland of England to here in New Zealand as they're setting up shop in Auckland and establishing a new city, um, the first church, the first stone church of New Zealand was St. Paul's Church. And we looked at this last week, and this was uh, a painting of that church. And as you can see, it was neo-Gothic in style. And in interestingly, the guy, the guy who was the architect, a guy called William Mason, he had built three churches in the UK prior to building St. Paul's, one of which was basically a carbon copy of St. Paul's called St. James's in, Bri in Brightlingsea, and that's still there. Um, and the other two were, one was a Romanesque style church, and the other was uh, like an octagon. It's quite a weird kind of almost circular building. I've got photos of them, but I didn't include them because I didn't think I'd tell you. Um, but, he, but what was interesting is out of those three very distinct styles, he chose the Gothic style to build St. Paul's, uh, which I personally like because I'm a bit of a fan of the old uh, Gothic. Uh, St. Paul's was expanded in 1863. Uh, the needs of the church had grown. The parish had grown. The city had grown. Uh, every week, people were being turned away from the pews. Isn't that a wonderful problem? And so the decision was made that we needed to expand the church by another 700 seats, uh, sorry, two 700 seats instead of the 400 it previously held. And so rather than knocking down the church and replacing it, what they decided to do was quite clever. Um, a guy called um, Thomas Mould, he built a new nave across the old nave, turning the old nave into the transepts, if that makes sense. So he kind of turned the church 90 degrees, flipped the altar from the east side to one of the other sides, um, and yeah, and just created a, a new nave across the middle, and that's how he did it. And that's why you can actually still see the old church there is still there in the middle with a whole new hall built across it. Um, and so that's what happened in 1863. But sadly, it didn't last because in 1884 the whole thing was demolished um, to make way for land reclamation when Bridemark Point was mined away, which we mentioned last week. It is sad, isn't it? Because it was such a, an amazing icon of a building, and it's tragically been lost. So uh, then this was the temporary church that we had for 10 years. 
from 1884 to 1895, while we're waiting for this one to be constructed and a new site to be found and everything else. Uh, and again, uh, neo-Gothic kind of in style. It's, this is what we call the Selwyn style because Selwyn essentially was trying to create the Gothic, found that you couldn't really do it in New Zealand uh, in the way they did in England because materials and talents and everything else were different. So he kind of created a hybrid best he could do with the materials and the skills at hand. Um, and this is what we have now, which is a very kind of classic, quite Kiwi uh, church style, which is quite cool. And yeah, that was our second church. And then uh, this is our current building. And you can see... Um, a couple of things have changed to it since it was originally built, but essentially it's the same. So every element of a Gothic building is designed to have some kind of meaning and representation. Even the effect of light pouring in through a stained glass window is supposed to uh, represent this idea of the divine coming down to illuminate the people in his church. Uh, so it's not purely decorative. It's, it's Again, it's sensing this idea of the mystic. Back in the medieval times, uh, churches were very dark, quite gloomy places, only illuminated by uh, the light coming through these small windows. And they would use a lot of incense that would create these smells. And there would be a rude screen, which is like a, a wooden screen that would separate the priest and the chancel from the rest of the congregation. And no one had access to scriptures. And the, the services were conducted in Latin. Um, and so there was this whole sense of you're entering a totally new world. Um, the very fact that the building was stone and not made of wood and mud was, again, this sense of kind of um, the unknown, the mysterious, the intangible, and creating uh, uh, this tangible sense of the mysteries of God and not understanding this whole faith, really. Um, and so a lot of that is still kind of captured in Neo-Gothic today. It's kind of based on that idea. Uh, rose windows typically appear either on the west face, like in our church, or in the transepts, like in some of the examples we've seen. Um, and they don't actually follow specific rules. So there, is, there are as many rose designs as there are rose windows. Each one is unique. Uh, and essentially, they provide an architect with a focal point to be able to, a focal point opportunity to convey a biblical message. Uh, they normally place the most significant aspect in the center and then kind of spread outwards from there in decreasing importance. So. Uh, here we have Chartres Cathedral. I mentioned the south transept rose, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail now. And this is a window that shows the, uh, the scene of Revelation 4, the throne room, uh, which John sees in his vision. And right there in the center, you have Christ enthroned, and he's blessing the onlooker. And uh, radiating out of that, in the, essentially the corners of the next circle, if that makes sense, you have the four heavenly creatures. And we'll talk about those a little bit later in another context. And then uh, in between the four heavenly creatures, you have eight angels, one angel who is speaking to John and seven angels of judgment, which pour out the bowls and open the scrolls and so forth, all that carnage. Um, and then reading out, uh, sorry, the next layer from there, you have the 24 elders with their crowns ready to cast them down. And finally, punctuating all of this, you have the heraldry of the family that donated the funds for this somewhat impressive window. So, again, we have a lovely example there of a, a biblical scene and a narrative portrayed in the glass of a rose window. So, Chartres Cathedral is a, is, a, yeah, is a lovely example of that. So, our St. Paul's building, including its rose window, um, was designed by William Skinner in 1893. This is him. Uh, so, Skinner was greatly inspired by the work of Gilbert Scott. Oh, how are we going? Here we go. So, he was... In, in, Inspired by the work of Gilbert Scott, he was a famous English architect and neo-Gothic uh, designer, and he had one New Zealand work, and that was Christchurch Cathedral. In the UK, he did the north transept for Westminster Abbey, and um, our rose on the outside is based on the north transept of Westminster Abbey, in its context, in its square, in the, um, the detailed triangle above it. Um, if you read the newspapers of the time where St. Paul's was opened and people were sharing their thoughts on Skinner's design on this somewhat expensive and highly anticipated church, um, some people love this uh, kind of reference and other people not so much. Uh, this is a sketch of Skinner's um, kind of dream, essentially what he wanted this church to look like had the whole thing been built. Um, and when you look th at that next to Christchurch Cathedral, uh, you'll see there's a lot of similarities. Remember, Christchurch is the work of Gilbert Scott, which is why this is relevant to this discussion. It's his only piece in New Zealand. Um, and when we take away the sketch and look at what we actually have, you'll see the resemblance is uh, very close indeed. When you look at them from the front. 
you'll see again, very similar. So the building itself draws a lot of connection from Christchurch Cathedral in its inspiration, um, but the rose exterior setting comes from Westminster Abbey, North Transept. But the inside is arguably from Chartres Cathedral, an abridged version of that window we just looked at. Here we are. So this, is, again, is the window of Chartres, and that was our window. Now, the window at Chartres is you know, many times larger than ours, uh, and many times more expensive than ours. Um, but it looks like Skinner was essentially taking this idea and basing his rose window uh, on it, in the same way that he was inspired by Westminster Abbey, and he was inspired by Christchurch Cathedral, he was probably also inspired by Chartres. And because it was such a significant building in terms of neo-Gothic uh, history, or Gothic architectural history, um, it's an arguable case. So if we look at an abridged version of Chartres on the left, if we take out that extra layer of circles, and we rotate the exterior rim just slightly so that it lines up again with how it would be if that <coughs> set of circles was missing, you'll see how it's almost a complete copy of what we have. Uh, the main difference seems to be this central image uh, where we have the, the like kind of this Trinitarian spiraling spirits in the middle of our window. Um, and incidentally, if you haven't seen that, that's actually mirrored again above our vestry doors and above the Lady Chapel doors. Uh, right there in the center, you've got the same image carved into wood, the same as you have it in the window there. Some people have argued that our window is actually um, the Trinity in the center, and then you have the 12 spokes or kind of uh, person, people shapes, I guess, are kind of the 12 apostles, and they're, they're branching out towards the flowering churches on the outside. Personally, I'm not sure where that theory has come from, um, and I suppose it's arguable, but I think if we look, when we compare this window with Chartres Cathedral, um, I would think it's probably more likely to be based on Chartres. And Chartres isn't about the shapes of the stonework, it's about the images in the glass. And since Skinner didn't leave us a design for the glass, it's possible that it's just a pattern. But we'll kind of look at that again at the end. Um, it's also believed that the cathedral glass we have in our rose window was actually a temporary installation. Um, because cathedral glass isn't usually, especially in a church building, considered like a permanent feature. It's often kind of an in-between because it's much cheaper until you can afford the proper stained glass. And I think if you were to pick any window in this church to, to fill with cathedral glass on a limited budget, that would be the obvious choice. And this idea is supported because in 1940s, a guy called Walter Hickson developed a scheme for the windows of the church. And in that scheme, he suggested that the rose window be filled with scenes of the Lord triumphant with attendant Old and New Testament saints in the spokes as an example of the Lord Triumphant, which is essentially the Ascension, from what I can gather from a quick Google search. Um, or alternatively, he suggested it be a, a window showing the tree of Jesse. Either way, it seemed to be a popular idea to replace a cathedral glass with stained glass, and people were happy with it. The scheme was advertised, funds were raised for its completion. It never took place, but again, it supports this idea that the cathedral glass was original and that, it was, um, that people were happy to replace it with stained glass when the funds were available. So that's everything I have really on the rows, and uh, we're going to talk now about the aisle windows. And then I'll just kind of introduce these, and then we'll take a break before we dive into each one individually. So we're going to talk about our aisle windows in just a moment, and uh, the best way to start this is by looking at the layout. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but actually um, the windows themselves have uh, plain glass for the most part. Remembering these are leaded glass windows, not stained. Uh, they have a colored border around the rim, a cross or sword pattern sort of in the background of the whole window, uh, a floral design in the cross beam of that cross shape, and an emblem in the middle, which has an emblem relevant to the apostle that they're representing, and a name in a scroll beneath it, which makes identifying those apostles nice and easy. Um, the layout, there's 17 windows in all, and with there being 12 apostles and 17 windows, they got around that problem by giving St. Paul his own single lancet window, this one here by the bell tower. Um, and it's the only one that's a single lancet. All the others are in pairs. And then on the outside corners, you have uh, four windows that are of the evangelists. Now, the evangelists are the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they each have their own windows on the corners, which leaves 12 in the middle, which are our 12 apostles. Now, if you're very good with your biblical knowledge, you'll know that two of the apostles were also gospel writers. And so they do appear twice. We have two windows for Matthew and for John. 
once as an evangelist and once as an apostle. So uh, just before the break, we'll have a look at the four evangelist windows, and they are these. Um, now, I mentioned before the four heavenly creatures that appeared in Shart's window, and they also appear here um, with our evangelists. So bit, cr early Christian art was pretty quick to associate the four heavenly creatures with the four evangelists, or the four gospel authors. And um, these creatures appeared in Ezekiel's vision, and they also appear in Revelation. And uh, they have four faces, these winged creatures that surround the throne of God. And one of them is the face of a man, one is the face of an eagle, one is the face of a lion, and one the face of a bull. And um, again, Christian art took these four animals and linked them with the gospel authors themselves based on the gospels and how those gospels begin. So Matthew's gospel begins with a genealogy of Christ, and it's talking about how he descended from uh, the line of Jesse. And so he gets the symbol of a man. Mark's gospel begins with John the Baptist roaring in the desert as a forerunner of Christ, and so he is the lion. Luke's gospel begins with Zechariah making sacrifices in the temple, and so Luke's gospel has the bull. And John's gospel begins with the divine logos, or the holy word, descending from heaven to earth. And at the time, the eagle was believed to be the largest bird, capable of soaring the highest, and therefore the only one capable of bringing down the divine logos. That is also why lecterns are brass, are brass eagles, because they hold the scriptures, and they hold that while you preach the word. Um, and so these four evangelist images appear throughout Christian iconography. Um, they're not unique to us, uh, and they're replicated um, not only in our windows, but also in our chancel. In the break time, if you have a look up where those beams of the ceiling meet the walls, you'll see there are these kind of designs there. We'll flick the lights on at the break. Um, and there are f the four heavenly creatures, and then there are uh, the, uh, the icons of the evangelists, excuse me, and then two seraphim at the far end, either side of the altar, like we find in Solomon's temple. Uh, these four evangelist windows also have the names of the representative uh, in the actual emblem itself, whereas all the apostle windows have their names on a scroll that's beneath the emblem, and that kind of sets them apart as being a different kind of window. And with that, we'll take a break. Um, okay, so we started um, talking about our uh, apostles' windows, and we've looked at the four evangelists, we've looked at the layout of the nave windows, um, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about um, iconography, essentially, within stained glass when you talk about particular characters. So, um, again, at a time where illiteracy was the norm and access to scriptures was heavily restricted, um, the reliance on art to uh, relay understanding and to tell stories can't be overemphasized. And so, but um, certain indicators exist within art that you can look out for that kind of show you who they're referring to. For example, apostles and saints have halos. Christ's halo has a cross in the halo, um, and we have that in our own Good Shepherd window, which we'll look at next week. Um, whenever Mary appears, she usually has either stars in her halo or around her halo. And um, John the Baptist is usually pointing upwards, uh, reflective of his message, always referring to the one to come. So these are some examples of uh, things you can look out for when you're trying to identify certain characters in stained glass windows. Um, but while the icons for the evangelists are very static, the four heavenly creatures, and essentially if you're going to do the four heavenly creatures, you know, the evangelists, that's the symbol you use, um, when it comes to the apostles, it's not quite so straightforward. Um, the Bible doesn't actually tell us very much about a lot of the apostles, certainly not what they got on with in their life or how they died. There's only uh, the description of one apostle how he died. So um, when it comes to their emblems, it can be a little bit more problematic. So our windows have emblems to the apostles that will sometimes be the same as you'll find in other churches, and sometimes they'll be quite different. Again, fortunately, they're all named, which makes our job nice and easy. So let's uh, start with the first single window, the window for St. Paul. And he has the symbol of a sword behind a book, or an open Bible. Uh, and these two images of St. Paul are classic. They're almost as, as regular as um, the keys for Peter. And um, the sword signifies both his violence towards the church originally, and also a reflection of his contribution to Scripture. Of course, the book is representative of his contribution to Scripture. I think Paul wrote about a third of the New Testament. And so he's a, the largest sole contributor to Scripture. 
Uh, and the book, the open book reads Spiritus Gladius, which is a sword of the spirit. Uh, and if you know your Pauline epistles in Ephesians, he talks about the armor of God and he refers to the word or scripture as being a sword. Um, so again, there's sort of like a play on words there between scripture and sword, um, his violence and his, his contribution to the, to the Bible. Uh, the sword is also linked to his death because Paul the Apostle was beheaded in Rome in 65 AD under Emperor Nero after the Great Fire of Rome. Incidentally, if you are a little bit squeamish, I do apologize, but the next what, 12 windows of the Apostles, most of their icons refer to um, their unfortunate end. And I'm not trying to make light of that, but just I'm trying to keep it quite stoic and just inform you that these are the facts, these are their emblems, and this is kind of what happened. So our next window, um, oh sorry, Paul also is reflected in our great east window above the altar, which you can't see and which we'll talk about in more detail next week. He's dressed in purple on the, to the right of Christ from our perspective, and he's offering Christ a sword. He's also the um, statue on the right of that window, and again, he's holding a Bible and a sword in his hand. And we know it's Paul not only because of his images, uh, but also because he's described as being Paul in, uh, when the sanctuary was opened and there was a, an article about it in the magazine. So moving on from Paul, we have uh, the evangelist window of St. Luke that we've kind of already talked about. So we'll skip over the evangelists and we come to uh, St. Matthias. Now St. Matthias was, uh, his symbol here is an Arabic sword or a curved sword over a closed book. And he was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot um, as the twelfth disciple through a lot, um, kind of through the Holy Spirit. You'll find about that in Acts 1. He preached, according to tradition, he preached the faith in Judea, uh, Cappadocia, and the northern regions of Asia Minor near the Caspian Sea. According to records, uh, one claims that he was stoned to death and then beheaded afterwards in Jerusalem around 63 to 65 AD. Another claims that he was crucified in Colchis in Ethiopia around 80 AD. So his symbol is probably um, a link to the claim that he was beheaded. So uh, the next window is for St. Jude. He was the brother of Simon the, Je the Zealot and James the Lesser. According to tradition, Jude was beaten to death with a club and then beheaded with a sword or an axe post-mortem in Beirut in Syria in 65 AD. His body was taken to Rome and buried in St. Peter's Basilica uh, alongside his brother. Uh, the ship symbol stems from the belief that he was a fisherman before following Jesus. And we have uh, a fishing harpoon or a fishing spear and a square rule. I'm not sure where the square rule comes from. Um, perhaps there's a tradition about him building something that I'm not aware of. Um, but that's the symbols that we have. Our next window is for St. Matthew. This is one of the ones that's doubled up with the evangelist window. Um, and his symbol in this church is three money bags. And uh, Matthew, as you'll probably know, was a tax collector in Capernaum before he was called to follow Jesus. And tradition says that Matthew preached the faith in Africa and was martyred in 65 AD while offering the Eucharist. The next window is St. Bartholomew, or is the money bags being a reference to him as a tax collector. Um, St. Bartholomew is the next one. He has a knife over an open book. Bartholomew was a nobleman. Uh, his name means son of Ptolemy. Tradition claims that Bartholomew traveled as far as India, preaching the gospel. On returning to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, he converted the Armenian king Polymeus, the king's brother, whose name I won't pronounce, ordered his execution in the Vaspukan province in Armenia. Beliefs vary on how he was killed. Some say he was beheaded with a knife, but most hold that he was skinned alive in 72 AD. Usually the symbol for St. Bartholomew is an empty human skin. Skipping ahead, St. John. The St. John symbol in our window is a snake in a cup. Uh, John was the youngest apostle, and he lived the longest. He was the only one to die naturally as an old man, and he's also the only one for whom there are no remains. According to Tertullian, Emperor Domitian had John brought to Rome and had him beaten and poisoned, but the poison came out of the cup in the form of a serpent, and John drank it unharmed. Domitian, another emperor, then threw John into boiling oil at the Latin gate. And when he emerged alive, the emperor apparently took pity and banished him to the Isle of Patmos instead. He later died at Ephesus as an old man around 98 or 101 AD. Uh, St. Andrew. St. Andrew was the brother of Peter, 
And together they were, called, uh, they were called as Jesus' first disciples to be fishers of men. Andrew preached in Asia Minor and Scythia, which is northern Iran, and then in Greece and Macedonia. Gregory of Tours recorded that St. Andrew was crucified on a crux decus, uh, basically the X-shaped cross, instead of the Latin T-shaped cross, after being scourged at Patras in 61 AD. Apparently, he preached for two days from the cross before he died. The crossed fish is probably a mix of his roots as a fisherman uh, with the X-shaped cross that he's famously associated with. Incidentally, the Scottish flag, which has St. Andrew as its patron, has the big cross on the flag. Um, so that concludes the North Wall. Uh, and I figured, amid all that death and horror, we should probably have a slight interlude before we continue with the South Wall. Um, so I mentioned last week that one of the uh, kind of classic moves of neo-Gothic architecture is to include um, life from lifeless stone. This idea of taking stone or wood and carving life and flowers and animals and things like that into that. Um, and so from around uh, 400, as early as 400 AD, we see the appearance of this character called the Green Man. Now, the Green Man uh, was originally a pagan character. We don't really know his roots, but he was certainly kind of adopted by the Christians, as they like to do with Christmas and all kinds of other things, um, and used as a symbol of kind of uh, creation, creation alive, um, kind of living creation, that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, there's as many uh, Green Men as there are rose windows. You know, they're like that. There's every design is individual and unique to the artist that's uh, creating them. Um, but some common features are usually lots of leaves flowing out of the mouth, sometimes out of the nose and the eyes as well. Um, and what I love about green men is they're kind of hidden in churches. Not every church has one, but when they are in churches, they're kind of hidden. They're a bit of like an Easter egg, if you can find them. And St. Paul's has a green man. And I was absolutely stoked when I found him while doing like a survey of some of the areas. So I'm going to give you a quick sneak peek. I'm not going to tell you where he is. Uh, and I'll let you kind of find him. But the reason I'm talking about him is he is uh, hi lurking around one of our aisle windows. And he looks like this. You can just about see his face there and leaves pouring out of his mouth. OK, back to death and horror. <laughs> so along our south wall, skipping over the evangelist Mark, and uh, we come to St. Peter. St. Peter, who has probably the most famous of all symbols, has um, the inverted cross and the crossed keys. According to tradition, Peter was crucified in Rome in 67 AD under Emperor Nero at the same time that St. Paul was being beheaded, following the great fire of Rome. Supposedly, Peter requested that the cross be inverted because he was not worthy to die the same way as his Lord. Peter is always also associated with keys, because in Matthew 16, 18, keys gave him the, uh, Jesus gave him the keys to heaven. And um, also, Peter is considered the first pope, if you're into, into your kind of church and Catholic history. Um, and so they take this idea of him being given the keys to heaven as being um, passed down by apostolic succession to each successive pope. And that's why the crossed keys is still the symbol of the pope today. Uh, the next window is James, the son of Zebedee, or James the Greater. He's usually uh, recognized with a scallop shell, uh, but in our windows, he's got a pilgrim staff and a pack. Uh, he was the first apostle to be martyred in 44 AD in Jerusalem by King Herod Agrippa, and is recorded in Acts chapter 12. He was either beheaded or stabbed. It's not clear. Um, the cockle shell that's usually associated with him stems from his roots as a fisherman when called by Jesus. But from the early Middle Ages onwards, uh, pilgrimages to St. James's grave in Jerusalem were by far the most popular of all pilgrimages that people took because he was the first martyred apostle. Um, and hence, we have the symbol of the pilgrim's staff and pilgrim's bag. Our next window is St. Philip. And for him, we have a towel cross, which is kind of a classic shape. Um, and two loaves, two bread loaves. According to tradition, Philip converted the wife of the proconsul of Heriopolis, and this enraged her husband, who had Philip crucified upside down in 62 AD. While hanging there, he continued to preach, and the crowd attempted to release him, but he refused. Another tradition says that he was stoned while hanging on the cross, and yet another says that Philip was beheaded at uh, Heriopolis in Fiagra. His symbols of the basket of loaves, or in this case, just two loaves of bread, 
comes from John 6, verse 7, when he expresses to Jesus the impossibility of feeding 5,000 people with so little food. Our next window is for St. Thomas. Um, it's reasonably well attested that Thomas traveled through Persia to India, where he was martyred by being run through with a spear in Chennai while he was at prayer in 72 AD. He was 33 years old. His symbol is usually either a spear because of his death or a square rule because he was a builder and is, generally, and is believed to have built the first church in India and a palace for the king, whose name, again, I won't pronounce. And we have a square rule and a spear. And James, the son of Alpheus, or James the Just, or James the Lesser, uh, for him we have a club. This one is rather unpleasant, but James stayed in Jerusalem to save the remnant of the Jews. However, the ancients of the Jews took him to the pinnacle of the temple and threatened to throw him off unless he renounced Christ. He refused and was thrown from the temple, but was still alive when he hit the ground. And a fuller came over who was working at the temple and dashed his head apart with a mallet in 62 AD which is where we get our club symbol from. Another tradition claims that he was cru crucified in Lower Egypt while he was preaching. But the, one, the first one is the more common. And lastly, Simon the Zealot. Well done, guys. You made it this far. We've got one more to go. It's quite a different crowd to my youth group, incidentally. They, they'd be disappointed there's only 12 windows. <laughs> Simon the Zealot is considered the most obscure of all the apostles, uh, with the least mention in the Gospels, and there's the more conflict about his martyrdom than anyone else's. There's a long list of potential martyrdoms, but the most widely accepted are that, while ministering alongside his brother Jude, Simon was crucified in Edessa in 67 AD. They are again buried together in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or that he was sawn in half in Surinir in Persia, which is where he gets his most common symbol of a saw. And we have a saw and an oar on our windows. That concludes our uh, unpleasant histories. And we're going to skip over John the Evangelist. Does anyone just need to just <laughs> inhale for a minute? And just really and carry on. It is sobering. I mean, it, it really does. Um, it reminds us the reality that surrounds us while we sit here in our comfortable church and complain about the sun streaming in our eyes through the clerestory windows. Um, you know, just cast your vision down a little bit to some of these kids and, uh, and remind yourself that you actually have it quite easy. I'm preaching to myself as much as everyone else. Um, okay, so let's talk again about our windows. Um, each window has a floral top, which we looked at at the beginning, uh, and we have four different uh, floor or fruit, and that's a rose, a grape, a pomegranate, and a lily. And uh, each pair of windows has the same uh, flora. I'm just going to refer to them as flora, even though sometimes it's a flower, sometimes it's a fruit. Um, each pair has the same, and then it's mirrored again by its twin on the opposite wall. Um, excluding the St. Paul's Lancet, again, they're in pairs and in partnerships. Each of the four symbols has a significant ecclesiastic representation. So the rose is a symbol of sacrifice or of Mary, the Virgin. Grapes used in the Eucharist are a symbol of the blood of Christ. Pomegranates, uh, with all their many, many seeds in one pod, represent the unity of the church, or immortality, or the resurrection. And lily is a symbol of beauty and purity. All four of them appear in uh, Song of Solomon together, and all four appear again uh, regularly throughout the New Testament in various places. So let's have a look, because we actually have them not just in our glass, but we have them in our building as well. So for the rose, we have uh, roses on the base of all of our four western wall windows that we looked at last week. Um, this is one actually just taken from Geoffrey Chaucer's window here. Um, if you have a look uh, at the lintels of our door frames somewhere along here, on all of our doors for the, the bell tower, the southern porch, the main entrance, vestry, lady chapel, they've all got these little carvings on them, and uh, most of them are either flowers or leaves, uh, some of which are arguably roses, although it's quite difficult to tell in most cases what exactly they are, because they've all kind of been squared off a bit, um, but we certainly have a lot of flowers. Um, and then this memorial here behind um, the coffee bar, which is to a sunken vessel, has roses carved into the top work just up here, uh, and that's these two here at the bottom. So we do have quite a few roses reflected in our building as well. Uh, the grape. The grape is abundant in carvings around this church. Uh, it is by far the strongest symbol out of the four, and we have it kind of everywhere. So uh, it will be a talk for another day to talk about the carvings and the pillars and what the significance is of those. But um, this, if you have a look, this pillar capital up here, 
This one here is laden with grapes. Uh, there's another one, I think it might be this one. No, it's this one here is laden with grapes. Uh, we have grapes in our chancel up there on one of these. We have grapes on our pulpit somewhere. Um, so there's grapes, grapes everywhere. And um, particularly the most significant ones are actually up here. This capital here is um, just flowing with grapes. All the others, it's kind of mixed in with the leaves. And the significance is, uh, my favorite two little bosses are just up here, and you've maybe not even seen them before, but right here you have Jesus with a crown of thorns, and here you have um, Mary looking somewhat sad. And linking with those bosses, we have grapes, symbolic of the blood of Christ, next to Jesus, and here we have passion flowers uh, linked with Mary traditionally, um, on that capital. So those bosses and capitals are kind of paired, and again, we have a very strong, significant grape motif going on up there. Pomegranates. Now, unfortunately, what we don't have is pomegranates, and it's a bit frustrating because I was hoping to find all four somewhere, but it seems uh, glaziers don't talk to carvers, <laughs> and um, I found this, and I thought perhaps these are pomegranates, and they are found on our pulpit. So they're one of these little clusters. They're all different and one of them is this one. I thought, oh, could that be a pomegranate? And then I Googled what a pomegranate looks like, and I think the answer is no. The leaves are wrong. The fruit is wrong. I just need to embrace the fact that there's no carving of a pomegranate, unless you can find one. But what I consoled myself with is we actually have lots of uncarved bosses. So there's plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of opportunity for, uh, for pomegranates. We could fill the clerestory with pomegranates. Uh, and lastly, the lily. There are, own, there are a handful of lilies, not many. Uh, mostly they are either side of St. Paul's window, just up here at the top of his pillars. And that's where we get these two images here on the left. Um, and they're lily flowers and leaves. And then one of these other windows, this one here, I think, um, has lilies, just the foliage on the pillars. But it, since a lily has a very distinctive leaf, if you're not aware of it, like a calla lily leaf, um, it's very clearly a lily leaf. So again, we have lilies in, uh, in our stone as well which I think is a nice touch. Um, now, we are leaded windows. We're probably, like the Rose Cathedral Glass, a temporary installation. Uh, referring again to uh, Walter Hickson's scheme to replace the various uh, windows with stained glass, he also wanted to replace all of our aisle windows with stained glass. And this was what his scheme looked like. He wanted to move all 12 apostles down towards the sanctuary for the first 12 windows. And instead of having leaded windows, he wanted to have full stained glass pictures of the apostles themselves. And then for the remaining four on this end, so it'd be these two, these two pairs here, and uh, he wanted to have uh, Abraham, Melchizedek, Elijah, and Moses. And he was going to keep St. Paul, but again, an image of St. Paul himself uh, in his single lancet. He also had designs for the clerestory, which is this top layer up here, which is currently all plain glass. And he had quite an elaborate scheme for them, actually. It's, um, it's quite impressive, and it's detailed on your notes. He wanted to have the, the three paired windows, so how they're kind of in sets of threes. Each set of three would be a complete scene. Um, the north wall was going to have St. Augustine, St. Aidan, who um, re-Christianized Britain with St. Oswald last week. We looked at that. Uh, St. Augustine, by the way, was the first Roman missionary to Britain. He kind of established Catholicism in England in uh, 595. Um, and then thirdly, Venerable Bede, who was a, a, a historian that I referred to last week. He is basically the guy that we have to thank for everything we know about Anglo-Saxon ecclesiastic history. He literally wrote the book, The Ecclesiastic History of Britain. Um, and Samuel Marsden, the, mission, the kind of early missionary to New Zealand. And they were going to essentially fill these four windows here. Um, their opposites on the south wall, on this side, were going to be uh, show notable women from scripture and contemporary New Zealand history. They were Ruth and Naomi, symbolic of steadfastness. St. Cecilia, representing art and religion. Elizabeth Fry, the symbol of charity. And nurse Edith Cavill, assisting those in danger. The two half lights up above the south porch, because there's no bell tower on that side, we have windows, and there we have a door that leads nowhere. Yet, thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, that door is supposed to lead to a gallery uh, or a choir that would rest on these pedestals here that were put in place, um, but that was never built. But you can see the windows here were shortened to allow for that. This pedestal doesn't extend down to allow for that. And again, there's a door uh, ready to be used. Uh, so when we do put a gallery in, which we will do, um, that door will be used. We'll have a point. Um, the so the two half lights up on this side, on the southern wall, 
Uh, they were going to represent transportation, a ship in full sail and an aeroplane in flight. Uh, and finally, the western lancets, either side of the rose, were going to be uh, St. Christopher, <laughs> beside the half-lights of transportation, um, and two contemporary New Zealand military figures, a sailor and a soldier, and Joan of Arc, I think, was going to be up in this top one. So it's an interesting scheme. I'm not entirely sure where he gets his ideas from or why, um, but that's what he put to paper, that's what was accepted by the vestry, what was advertised as being the scheme that they wanted to implement, uh, and that's what funds were raised for. Um, in closing, I'd like to return to our rose window, and then we'll take some questions. Um, I would suggest if Skinner had a specific goal in mind of what he wanted to ultimately fill those panes with, he would have left instructions or a design. But there are no such suggestions in his plans, and so it's probably just a geometric pattern based on Chartres rows, filled with a temporary cathedral glass as a feature for his neo-Gothic architecture. After all, the role of the architect is to design the meta-narrative, the grand overall canvas on which other art artisans are inspired to work. For example, Skinner's plans include squiggles on the capitals and on the hood bosses, but exactly what form they took was the decisions of Captain Felden, 15 years later, who actually carved them. Every other window in the church was plain glass when the doors opened, and again, there was no scheme left suggesting what to fill them with. So in many ways, this is a reflection of how God works with us, his living church on the earth. Our great architect, no doubt, has plans in mind, patterns, and even hopes and intentions. But the specifics of what we do, how we serve, where we live, and what we give our time to, is largely up to us. Like the parable of the talents, the master didn't mind what his servants did as long as they used what he gave them. I think God provides us with sacred spaces in our lives. So may we, like our rose, fill them with color, beauty, and light. May whatever we do shine like precious gems and create that sense of the divine pouring in from above and illuminating the lives of others. Thanks. <laughs>